Maltodextrin. You see it on the label. Do you drop the product and run? Click the back arrow so fast you strain your finger? Or do you move on and see what else the product has to offer? How harmful is maltodextrin? What risk are you really taking each time you consume it? Hang out for the next few minutes and we'll dive into what it is, what it does, why it's on the label, when you should be concerned about it, and when you can just let it go. Let it go. Welcome to Supplementary Knowledge Under the Label. Maltodextrin with Dr. B. This series takes different food and supplement ingredients and looks at the pros and cons. I'll help you see the good, the bad, and the scary for that ingredient. It's very rare that any one item is all good or all bad. This series tackles all that using a direct, factual approach. I'm not here to tell you what to think. Just show you a few resources and present as complete a picture as possible. For this episode, we're talking about maltodextrin. What is maltodextrin? Well, maltodextrin is often referred to as though it were a single compound. That's like saying there's only one kind of sugar or one kind of flour. Maltodextrin is a general term for a class of simple starches with varying lengths By regulation, maltodextrin must contain less than 20% sugar and have an average degree of polymerization greater than 5. So what does all that mean? In simple terms, maltodextrins will never be more sweet than about 5% that of sugar. It also means that a maltodextrin molecule has at least 5 sugar units linked in a chain. Chains may be as long as 20 units. Yes, maltodextrin is made of sugar, but it is not sugar. Close, but not the same. We'll talk more about this difference as we go along. Just for the record, fiber is also made of sugar, just arranged in such a way that our bodies cannot fully digest it. Maltodextrins are usually not a single chain of glucose molecules, but often have branches. These branches may be short, just a couple glucose units, or a bit longer, a dozen or more glucose units. All maltodextrins are given a dextrose equivalent value. This is basically a percentage of the material that is simple sugars. Again, by definition, maltodextrins have a dextrose equivalent of 20 or less. In other words, no more than 20% of any maltodextrin are simple sugars. 80% or more are chains of sugars, otherwise known as simple starches. Put another way, the lower the dextrose equivalent, the longer the maltodextrin change. Higher dextrose equivalents mean more simple sugars. In addition to the differences that we covered earlier, maltodextrins can also be manufactured in such a way as to change its physical appearance, density, and flow properties. Some are very fine powders, like flour. Others are more granule, almost crystalline, like sugar or salt, and lots of options in between. Maltodextrins come in a number of varieties. They can be made from corn, potato, tapioca, rice, and several other starting materials. Corn is by far the most common source. Of course, both GMO and non-GMO forms are available. This is just one small example of the different dextrose equivalent grades and also some varieties that differ based on particle size and other physical properties. There are several very large companies that specialize in maltodextrins. Each of these differences provides a different effect in the finished product. We'll talk about that next. Some of these differences can also affect how the maltodextrin is digested and used by the body. We'll cover those aspects in a bit. So you can see that maltodextrin is not a single ingredient. It's many related but different small starches. Maltodextrins fill a number of roles in modern food and supplements. Let's take a few minutes to run through some of the major uses. Probably the most well-known and maligned use 
maltodextrin is as a filler. It simply takes up space in a product. Need a full capsule, sachet, stick pack, or whatever. Add in some maltodextrin. It's cheap, doesn't change the flavor, and mixes, flows, and disperses well. A thickener. Certain forms, usually the more branched forms, will increase the thickness of liquids. This is one of the most common uses for maltodextrins. Sauces, gravies, smoothies, all that kind of stuff. Frequently use maltodextrin as a thickener. You may also find maltodextrins in bakery items like breads and pastries for this same purpose. Diluent and flow. A diluent is something that dilutes something else. Again, due to the excellent flow characteristics and affordability of maltodextrin, it is often used to spread out more problematic ingredients so that the overall blend or mix will work better in encapsulation, tableting, mixing, baking, or whatever other production machinery. Likewise, maltodextrin can be added to just modify the flow characteristics of the powder blend. Sweetness. While not a very common use for maltodextrin, it is sometimes used to add a very, very slight sweetness to a product. It's a poor substitute for sugar, having only about 5% of the sweetness of sugar. But sometimes, that's all you need. Energy. Believe it or not, maltodextrin is actually a good energy source. It is digested similarly to sugar. We'll get into this in a bit more detail in just a minute. However, the branching and chain length adds some variability to the equation. Lastly, and quickly, I want to mention a small category of modified maltodextrins. This is a relatively new addition to the maltodextrin portfolio. These versions are fiber-like. Fiber? They've been chemically modified to look and act more like fiber. You'll often see these in products that make a high in fiber claim or in drinks that contain fiber yet are clear or colorless. The jury is still out on how well these modified maltodextrins actually replace more natural fiber forms, though they do appear to offer some fiber benefits. It's also worth noting here that these modified maltodextrins are not digested. They're not at all like sugar. So what does maltodextrin do in the body? It's a carbohydrate, plain and simple. It's a string of sugar molecules like every other type of carbohydrate. As noted before, maltodextrins can be and are an energy source. Your body treats maltodextrin much like it does the starch in your bread, biscuits, cookies, and crackers. It all eventually breaks down into sugar. There's that nasty word again, sugar. But sugar is not all bad. Excess sugar, especially refined sugars, are definitely not healthy. However, sugar is your body's main and preferred energy source. Every cell in your body needs sugar. Some can get by with other energy sources, but all prefer sugar. Whether you eat straight sugar, a variety of starches, all fat, or all protein, your body still converts some of this into sugar. There are some cells in the body that must have sugar to survive. Therefore, your body is capable of making sugar from fats or proteins to make sure these cells live on. There are two related concepts that we should address when talking about sugar within the body. These are glycemic index and glycemic load. The details of these concepts are well beyond our purposes here, so I'll boil them down into a few quick sentences and one major point. Glycemic index, or GI, is a number that represents how quickly a carbohydrate is converted to sugar in the blood. Numbers over 100 are quickly converted, under 100 are more slowly converted. Maltodextrins are 90 to 115. Glycemic load, or GL, takes the concept of glycemic index and multiplies it by the amount of available carbohydrate. A lower GI food with a large amount of carbohydrate 
can be just as bad on your blood sugar as a smaller amount of a high GI food. A glycemic load of 20 or more is considered high, while a glycemic load less than 10 is considered low. I bring these concepts up in order to make one point. In a majority of cases, maltodextrins are used in relatively small quantities, usually 5 grams or less per serving. This equates to a GL of 5 or less, aka a low glycemic food. Many times, maltodextrin is used in much, much lower quantities. In other words, a large majority of maltodextrin uses have glycemic loads of less than 1. Very, very low glycemic foods. So, pop quiz. Which is worse? 2 tablespoons of raisins or 2 cups of of watermelon. Spoiler alert, the raisins have a much higher glycemic load, 27 versus 4. As with any carbohydrate, the digestion of maltodextrin requires enzymes. This all starts in the mouth with an enzyme called alpha amylase. Alpha amylase begins a process of breaking off groups of 2-glucose or sugar molecules from the long maltodextrin chain. Not a lot happens with oral alpha amylase due to the short time it is in contact with maltodextrin. The alpha amylase produced by the pancreas does a majority of this breakdown in the upper small intestine. These chunks of two glucose units called maltose are either absorbed directly by the intestine or further broken down into single sugar units by the cells along the intestines. In the end, maltodextrins are metabolized much the same way as sugar and other starches. In most cases, maltodextrin is treated by the body very similarly to sugar. Sensitivity to dietary sugars varies from person to person. However, the general rule is that 10 grams of sugar is needed to increase blood sugar by a few points. Amounts less than this may not have a measurable impact on blood sugar. Even larger amounts of sugar are required to alter blood sugar if it's combined with fats, proteins, or both. So sugar as part of a healthy meal is less of a concern than sugar on an empty stomach. Maltodextrin in your gravy is less of a concern than maltodextrin in your sports drink. There we go. Everything you wanted to know about maltodextrin. This starch has a lot of uses, which explains why it shows up in so many foods, drinks, and supplements. There is a lot of misinformation and exaggeration around the internet about maltodextrin. There's a kernel of truth to some of that information, but some of it is just plain wrong. Maltodextrin is really a bunch of similar molecules. Some are small chains mixed with some simple sugars, and others are longer chains with very few simple sugars. In addition, maltodextrins come in a variety of different powder types. Fine powders for some uses, more coarse ones for others. In the end, like a lot of things, it really all depends on how much you consume in total and how much you eat at any one time. It also matters what you eat with the maltodextrin as fats and proteins will change the speed with which maltodextrins are broken down and digested. It's kind of hard to tell just how much maltodextrin might be in any particular food. Sometimes you can make a guess by looking at the total carbohydrates listed on the label. Take that number, subtract the fiber and added sugars, and that's the maximum amount that could be in the product. But it's probably a lot less than that, as there are usually other starches present. Here I give you a quick an example of what I came across just the other day. This was a Christmas gift from a neighbor, and you look at the label, you can see maltodextrin is the number one ingredient. If you look up in the supplement facts, you can see just how much starch, how much total carbohydrate there is. One gram. Now look at the serving size, 1.8 grams. So if we do the math here, one gram is the maximum amount of, of maltodextrin present in this particular product. Now again, that's well below the 10 gram limit. It's probably not going to have an effect. Plus, this is being mixed into two avocados, adding in some additional fats. 
So even though maltodextrin is your number one ingredient in this product, it's probably not a major concern as it's not being consumed by itself. It's being mixed with the avocado and then chips and whatever else you might be having that with, your toast, whatever it might be. And so you can get a, just a quick real world example of one use of maltodextrin. So it is probably safe to bet that almost all supplements contain five grams or less of maltodextrin, just like the example I just showed you. Drinks and foods may contain more, though in many cases, probably not. That means that in many cases, the amount of maltodextrin in any single item is probably not enough to have a dramatic impact on blood sugar, especially if you consume these items with other foods. I'm shocked! So, should you avoid maltodextrin? Not necessarily. It's really the total amount of maltodextrin that you consume, particularly how much you eat at a single time, that is the real concern. If you're avoiding processed, prepackaged foods, and many of those grab and go convenience items, then you're probably not getting a lot of maltodextrin at any one time. In that case, a little in a snack or a supplement is probably not a concern and certainly nothing to run kicking and screaming from. Be aware what you're eating. Be educated on what you put in your body. Choose wisely. Very few things are toxic in small quantities. Remember to step back and take a look at the big picture. Don't let yourself be overwhelmed by tiny stuff. There's almost always more to the story. Here at Supplementary Knowledge, we strive to present as much of the whole story as possible and do it in at least a mildly entertaining, matter-of-fact way. Use this and other reliable sources to inform your decisions. You will find in the video notes below all the resources I used putting this together, links to the studies, and other reliable sources of information you can use to double-check what I've had to say, and to further your own education on this topic. If you find this information helpful, or at least not very annoying, then please subscribe, like, tick that bell, and leave a comment telling me what you would like covered next. Boom! Knowledge supplemented. See you next time.